Today I want to talk to you about David. Uh, If you want to follow along in your Bible, I'll be referencing some scriptures about David, mostly in 1 Samuel is where we'll be, from around the 19th chapter into very well the end of the book. I'm going to we're going to be doing some reading, but we're also going to be, I'm going to be summarizing a lot, quite a bit of what is going on in David's life today, or, or what went on in David's life, I guess I should say. I guess it's not going on today, but um, I'm going to be talking a lot about David, and, but, but the, the, the title of my lesson this morning is Inquire or Require. I think we find David as a good example for a For a lot of things, and a bad example for a lot of things as well. We find him to be completely human. That's the most important thing that we, that I think most of us kind of get out of the story of David, is that we see that he is completely human. He has his good days, and he has his bad days. And it seems like even more so, sometimes his good days are much better than the good days you and I could ever have, and his bad days maybe are much better than the bad days we could ever have as well. He's, he's far from the Lord, but he's close to him. He spends time with the Lord, and he asks the Lord for things, and in some moments he turns his back completely on God. And so that's the direction I want to take, take this morning, is I want us to just be in the Word and kind of see what God is doing through David in the time and the place where he was. David's initial story is familiar to us. We talk a lot about Goliath, how he slayed the giant. Before that, obviously, Samuel anointed him the next king of Israel. But what happens next? We all know that as he kills Goliath, he comes to live with Saul and Jonathan in King Saul's house. He begins to be given tasks and fulfills them better than anyone can imagine a young boy of his age could. Out of Saul's jealousy... He gives David a military command of a thousand men, hoping that the young boy will not be able to truly be a leader and surely die in battle. Because Saul is jealous, I'm going to repeat that, because Saul is jealous, he gives him a command and says, here, you go run this, and we'll see if you can take care of, take care of a mil- an army. Because Saul does not want him to inherit the kingdom. He wants his son Jonathan to. Instead, David excels at being a leader and becomes the top commander in King Saul's army. God is protecting his servant David. Saul tries to kill David because he realizes that that David, or excuse me, that God is on David's side. Jonathan helps David escape, and David becomes a hunted man. In 1 Samuel chapter 22, David is eventually joined by, in a direct quote, all those who were in distress or in debt or discontented. That's chapter 22 and verse 2. He becomes their leader as he is joined by these people. And it feels like a little bit like the Robin Hood story. Rob from the rich to save the poor. All the discontented come and follow him. And they become his men, his army. And God has built him a small army of people who are in trouble. God continues to protect his servant, David. David and his people, on one hand, continue to run for the armies of Saul. And on the other hand, continue to protect the people of the land from the Philistines. Twice, David even finds himself in a place where he can kill Saul and make all of his suffering and running from the king go away. He doesn't kill him. Instead, remembering this, chapter 26, verse 9, he says this, Who can lay a hand on the Lord's anointed and remain guiltless? Saul's hand is delivered to him and where he can kill him, and that's what he has to say about it. His only hope in his eyes at this point is that Saul will cease to pursue him because he gives mercy and does not kill Saul when he has the chance. Twice. It doesn't work, of course. And David's personal well of hope 
runs dry. And I say that very specifically. David's personal well of hope runs dry. Because this is the moment where his well of hope is not being run by God all of a sudden. It's being run from his own desire. He becomes a man who is tired of running. He, becomes, he grows weary of sleeping with one eye open, running from Saul. So he becomes the man that when backed into a corner, decides to fix his own problems instead of believing God's promises. And we all say, David, David, why, why have you forgotten God's promises to you? Through Jonathan, through Jonathan, he promised you that you will for sure be king over Israel. Through Abigail, your wife, God echoed that he will certainly make a lasting dynasty through you, David. Even out of the mouth of Saul, the man trying to kill him. In 1 Samuel chapter 24, verse 20, the quote says, I know that you will surely be king and that the kingdom of Israel will be established in your hands. The very king himself who is trying to kill David speaks these words. And yet David can't believe it because he's tired of running. He's tired of running under his own power. David quickly turns from the man who inquires of the Lord to the man who requires of the Lord. He requires the Lord to help him in his own plan to stay safe rather than having faith in God's plan. Turn over to 1 Samuel chapter 27. 1 Samuel chapter 27 in verse 1. But David thought to himself, one of these days I will be destroyed by the hand of Saul. The best thing I can do is to escape the land of the Philistines. But David thought to himself. <laughs> he didn't inquire of the Lord. He thought to himself. Then Saul will give up searching for me in Israel, and anywhere in Israel, and I will slip out of his hands. So David and the 600 men with him left and went to Achish, son of Maok, king of Gath. David and his men settled in Gath with Achish. Each man had his family with him, and David had his two wives. I, I, pardon my pronunciation. Ahinoam of Jezreel and Abigail of Carmel, the widow of Nabal. When Saul was told that David had fled to Gath, he no longer searched for him. Guess what? David's plan worked. Sort of. Because, did you notice where he fled to? Who is Achish? Achish is the king of Gath. Anybody else notice that Gath is the same place where Goliath the giant came from? So he defeats Goliath the giant. He's told he's going to be, and he's anointed as the next king of Israel. He runs from Saul right into where? The enemy's territory. And it's a good idea to him, is the most amusing part. The most amusing part. First Samuel chapter 17, verse 4, a champion named Goliath, who was from Gath, came out of the Philistine camp. David, the former commander of Israel and slayer of Gath's giant, seeks refuge with Goliath's people. Continuing in verse 5, Then David said to Achish, If I have found favor in your eyes, let a place be assigned to me in one of the country towns, that I may live there. Why should your servant live in the royal city?
I think the most interesting thing to me is that it seems that God is still taking care of his servant David, even though David may not even know it. Because the most interesting part about this story to me is whenever you get to the very end of 1 Samuel, the very battle that David is held out of with the Philistines is eventually the death of Saul, who he refused to kill two times already. Kind of interesting. Is God protecting David? Absolutely. Now, protecting to what end? Because difficulty is not over. When they arrive home, they find their city and homes in Ziklag burned to the ground and their families and people of the city carried off by the Amalekites. It's not over yet, is it? Here we go. What's more, David's men are wanting to stone him because in chapter 30, verse 6, the quote is, each one was found, I'm sorry, each one was bitter in spirit because of his sons and daughters. But David found strength in the Lord his God. For the first time in 16 months, David found strength in the Lord his God. And two verses later, David inquired of the Lord. Shall I pursue this raiding party, he asked God. Will I overtake them? God responds, pursue them. You will certainly overtake them and succeed in the rescue. This is the David, is beginning to be again the David that we want to know and in some ways to be like. He has come back to God. He has sought the counsel of God again. And as long as he continues to do so, he continues to walk with God and carry out God's plan. Of course, we all know throughout the story of David, he's not necessarily the best at this. But he does have some successes. It started before this, where we are in this story, in 1 Samuel chapter 23, when he went into the battle with, with the Philistines to save the people of Kelah, which were people from Israel. First, David inquired of the Lord when he went, before he went into that battle. Two verses later, when David had a feeling of unrest because his men were not confident in the decision to go out against the Philistines, David again inquired of the Lord. In 2 Samuel chapter 2, verse 1, when David was having a hard time deciding what to do after Saul's death, because he, the anointed, next in line, king of Israel, was still being hunted by King Saul's men, David inquired of the Lord. In, chapter two, in, in 2 Samuel chapter 5, verse 19, when crowned as king, and pursued by the now vengeful Philistines, because not too long ago he had lived in their land and was a servant of their leader, David inquired of the Lord. And after defeating the Philistines, the Philistines mounted yet another attack, because they were not done with him. But David inquired of the Lord. The David inquired of the Lord is a direct quote from the Bible every single time. David inquired of the Lord. This David is strong when he acquires of the, inquires of the Lord. This David is bold. He is faithful. He is steadfast. He is a leader. He is the man after God's own heart. And that's the David that we all kind of aspire to be. The one that even the most difficult times goes straight to God first for answers. And it... And yet, we've all been there. We've all been in scenarios where we struggle and we're weary and we're tired and we don't know what to do. And we start coming up with our own plans of how to get out of it instead of seeking the Lord first. I want to read to you, or I want you to read with me, yet again, Psalm 32. Psalm 32, I think, echoes David's journey in these 10 chapters or so. Blessed is he whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man whose sin the Lord does not count against him, and in whose spirit is no deceit. When I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night, your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was sapped as in the heat of summer. 
Then I acknowledged my sin to you and did not cover up my, in- my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. Therefore, let everyone who is godly pray to you while you may be found. Surely, when the mighty waters rise, they will not reach him. You are my hiding place. You will protect me from trouble and surround me with the songs of deliverance. I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will conduct you and watch over and watch over you. Do not be like the horse or the mule, which have no understanding, but must be controlled by bit and bridle, or they will not come to you. Many are the woes of the wicked, but the Lord's unfailing love surrounds the man who trusts in him. Rejoice in the Lord and be glad, you righteous. Sing, all you who are upright in heart. It just feels like something that may have come out of his 16 months living with the enemy. And I don't know about the people in this room today, if you're in the middle of your 16 months living with the enemy, or if you come out of your living with the enemy, or if you feel like you might be going in to living with the enemy. I don't know. Here's what I do want to do, though. I want us to spend a little bit of time in prayer here. But we're going to do a little bit of an exercise, and it might require you to be a little bit more forward with how you take advantage of this exercise, okay? Here in a minute, I want to pray for a few of the people, or maybe many of the people who have been directly affected in this way today, or are currently living in this scenario. And what I want you to do, I'm going to describe those, and then I'll ask if you have been affected by that, by that scenario. I want you to stand. Yes, I know it's uncomfortable, because you may not feel very good about what's going on in your life. I know. But this is the place where we can, where we can say, it's okay, I want to change things. Okay? This is the place. And so I'm going to read off a couple of scenarios. I want you to stand if this affects you. Now, you will not be standing alone. Because, ladies and gentlemen, if you see somebody stand up, I would like for you to go gather around them, to go place your hands on them. We're going to pray for them, okay? And so, but we want this to be a time of healing and a time where we can actually be forward about what's going on in our life. And what my true hope is this. My true hope is that this leads to conversations with people in our church that we can actually talk to about what's going on in our lives. It doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to be talking to everybody in the congregation, but it will mean that we get to talk to somebody. Okay? Here's what I'd like for, for us to pray for today. I want us to pray for the people who are stuck in the land of the enemy and want to get out. I want us to pray for the people who feel like you're fighting a losing battle and are growing weary in your walk. I want to pray for the people that know you have a tough week or a tough season coming ahead, and you need to inquire of the Lord. If, that, if those, one of those three things describes you, will you please just stand where you are so we can pray for you? that describes you, you can pl- feel free to continue to stand. If that does not describe you, pl- please, excuse me, please feel free to go surround these people. This is a little bit atypical of how, t- how we typically work in sitting in our, in our church in our pews, but please stand up. Let's move. Let's do something for these people. Let's pray. Father, we need your strength. We need to pursue your way for us. We need to know what your way is. We need you to lock Satan out of our life. And we need you to take captive our sin. Father, there are those of us here today that are really struggling. 
and that know that there are things that we are, that we are tackling, whether they be right now or whether they be in the future, or maybe it's just things we need to get out of. We know that you can take control. We know that. And Father, we want you to change our lives one day at a time. And not just change them, but let us know that they're being changed. We want you to walk with us. We want to be able to speak with you and know that you're there, still walking along us as we ride our bicycle. We want you to know, we want to know that you are taking care of us with everything you have. And our promise to you, God, is that we will seek you with everything that we have as well. But please, please, please help us in the life scenario that we're dealing with right now. Father, you are in control. And we don't want to let a minute go by without knowing that and without confessing that to you. Father, take away our sin. Take away the things that we are struggling with the most so that we can focus on you and that you can continue to push us to be who you want us to be and to carry out the life that you want us to live. Father, there may be others of us that, that may not necessarily feel comfortable standing, but we need you just as much. We pray that you'd be with our boldness and our comfortability with our church family, that we would be able to tell our church family things that are going on in our life. Father, I pray that you'd be with this church. I pray that you bless this church. But above all, Father, I pray that you help our church be real with each other and to grow together as friends and family. We love you so much, Father. We pray all these things in your name. Amen.